Paul Reitzer. Thank you. We have the president of the Marketing AI Institute. Paul and I have kind of known each other for the last 15 years on and off within Northeast Ohio's community. Um, I know there's a few of us today that, that might know PR 2020, um, Paul's background. I'll let him talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but excited to have Paul with us. He's going to spend 20 minutes kind of just giving us more of an overview um, on everything marketing and AI today. And then really, we have the next 35, 40 minutes uh, to spend some time together, you know, asking questions, having a conversation about AI. I've got eight to 10 questions teed up. I know that um, there's a good chunk of people uh, that are at the AI CPA Engage conference this week as well. So we'll be recording it uh, for those that couldn't make it. We'll be announcing our second quarterly check-in here in the next couple weeks. Um, and then the only other thing that I would say is we're looking to finalize our 2024 dates for Digital Deep Dive um, on April 3rd and 4th in Atlanta again um, for next year. So without further ado, Paul, very informal introduction, but I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, fill in the gaps if you don't mind. Um, talk a little bit about the conference and uh, looking forward to a good conversation today. Yeah, great. Thank you. It's good to be with everyone. Uh, as David said, I'm just going to do a kind of a light introduction here just to level set on some key ideas and fundamentals of AI, just so we're all on the same page going into the Q&A and then really spend most of the time just talking and answering questions. What I'll often say is, while this is positioned as a marketing conversation, what I have found is oftentimes when I do talks like this to different groups of people, their interests start to expand out once they connect the dots into like what's happening with AI and politics, what's up with the existential threat to humanity letter, um, what's the impact on knowledge work, uh, ethics, responsible AI. We can talk about any of it. You can keep it marketing focused or we can expand out. I spend a lot of time thinking and talking about the macro level stuff about AI that has nothing to do with marketing. So if we want to go there, we can go there. Um, so as David said, I started Marketing AI Institute in 2016 when I still had my agency. I sold the agency in 2021 to focus on my AI research and work. Uh, this is a, you know, my background is kind of a representative of why I think this is an opportunity for all of you. Um, you don't need to be a data scientist, machine learning engineer, you don't have to go back to school. I was a journalism school grad. I ran an agency and I figured out AI. You know, I've spent a decade plus working on AI, but the basic premise is it's just smarter tech. Like at the end of the day, we all buy marketing technology. We have email, CRM, social, ad. We have all these technologies we use that generally speaking have very little AI, if any, in them. And so it's all human all the time. Like all, it's all rules-based. It only gets better if we get better, smarter. And we're moving toward a future where the software itself gets smarter, basically. It helps us do our job faster, better, um, more creatively. And so that's really what it's all about is just smarter technologies. And so for me, Chad GPT was sort of this blessing and curse um, moment in my life. So I had spent you know, the better part of six years building Marketing AI Institute, trying to get marketers to care about AI, to understand that it was going to change everything. And I mean, we'd had some success. We had 30,000 subscribers. You know, I was losing money doing it, but like we were building something. We had a vision to you know build and change the industry. And then ChatGPT shows up and like everybody knew about AI. So I no longer had to worry about being the one to like convey that this was really important to people. By January, 100 million people had used ChatGPT. So AI had been introduced to the world. Um, but a lot of people assumed that ChatGPT was it, that they just had to figure out how to use ChatGPT and that was AI and then they could move on with their life. And so what they didn't realize is that AI is like, been going on since the 1950s. Like this theory that machines would be able to do human-like things is not new. It's been researched and and you know been attempted to build uh, for decades. And then even before ChatGPT, like ChatGPT didn't create the generative AI space. This was a, a logo scape from early November of last year before ChatGPT, showing 250 generative AI tools. So the space was already exploding before ChatGPT showed up. And then if you rewind back to March of 2021, so a year and a half before ChatGPT, co-founder and CEO of OpenAI, Sam Altman, wrote a blog post called Moore's Law for Everything, where he told us, listen, the AI we're about to unveil is going to think, it's going to create, it's going to have understanding, it's going to have reasoning. And the reason in context this is significant 
is that chat GPT technology was two years old when it came out in November of 2022. OpenAI had that tech in their lab for two years. He knew exactly what it was capable of doing. And he knew that society and the business world weren't ready for it. So he was trying to kind of prime us that like, hey, it's going to do this stuff. And the problem was most business leaders and marketers weren't listening. They, they didn't really connect the dots. They didn't think they were still sci-fi. It was still abstract. It wasn't real. And then Dolly 2 came out in spring of last year where you could do image generation. And then all of a sudden, ChatGPT shows up and anyone anywhere in the world with for free could generate articles and blog posts and emails and plans. And all of a sudden, it was this very real technology, but most people didn't comprehend it. So what this means to us now is we're moving in this phase where AI historically, you know, for the last 10 years has been an ever-present part of our consumer lives. We just didn't know it or realize it. And it's going to be the same in marketing and business. So when you think about your consumer life, there are all these applications, all these technologies, all these companies that exist and have been built over the last 10 years doing incredible things but they're basically just using machine learning, a form of AI to make predictions about your behavior and to make predictions about outcomes. So you have Gmail predicting words in the sentence, YouTube predicting what videos you'll watch, Spotify learning the music you like and predicting music and podcasts. Like this has been our exposure to AI largely in our consumer life, but now the same thing's gonna happen in our business life. So this makes it really hard as marketing leaders to look out to the future and say, what should our team look like? What kind of tech stack should we have? What are our strategies going to be? Because we're actually at the base of an exponential growth curve in this technology. The whole premise of Moore's Law for Everything from Sam Altman is that the power of these things are going to double every like six to 12 months. So GPT-4, if, if you haven't used it, I'll show you a sample in a moment. It's it's shocking. Like I live this stuff and there's still times where I'm shocked by what it can do. It was eight month old technology when it came out. So GPT-4 is already a year old technology. These research labs, generally speaking, have technology that's 12 to 18 months ahead of what they're releasing. There are more powerful versions of this stuff already sitting in labs. That's a really hard thing to conceive of and to actually build plans around when we're having trouble comprehending what it already does. So that's where we're heading is this, this phase, certainly in marketing, but absolutely in knowledge work, you know, in the accounting profession, we're heading into a phase where AI is going to assist us in almost everything we do. So we say 80% or more of what we do as knowledge workers is gonna be AI assisted within the next two to three years. In some professions, that'll happen quicker. In others, it may take a little longer, but on average, uh, two to three years. And the reason is because you start to look at all the tactical things that we do in our jobs. And again, in the accounting profession or in marketing, and you say, okay, if the thing we do, the tactical thing we're doing, writing an email, creating a blog post, doing social shares, managing an ad budget, whatever it is, if it's data-driven, meaning we use data to make decisions or predictions, it's repetitive. We do the same 15 things every time we launch a podcast. It's predictive. We're trying to predict, are they going to open the email? Are they going to click on the thing? Is the ad spend going to generate the results we want? Or is it generative, meaning images, language, video, audio, code? Like, is it generating something? If the answer is yes to any of these things, then you have a potential use case for AI to assist you in doing that thing. So the future of all marketing and really all business is what is the machine going to do and what's the human going to do? And so we created this marketer to machine scale which we talk about in the book. There's a whole chapter dedicated to this. But the basic premise is most software you use today is at level zero. Like it's all you. It doesn't get better without you. You have to go learn how to use new features, all this stuff. What we're trying to get to is level one and level two. We're trying to, to move to using smarter technology that assists us in doing what we do to the point where we can maybe increase productivity 10%, 20%, in some cases, 50%. Um, if it's customer service, it may, it may become 90%, hundred percent. Like that's what we're looking for. Level three is probably possible with some of the generative AI tools today. It's becoming more possible. Level four doesn't exist and shouldn't, in my opinion, like we're not trying to get humans out of the loop, um, because this stuff is imperfect. Those generative AI tools in particular make mistakes all the time. So in the accounting profession, you can't just rely on these tools to replace accountants. Like that's not how this works. Um, but you may not need as many, like that's the kind of the, the working premise 
is we still need humans. We're just not sure yet if we need as many humans doing what we do. So the reason the adoption curve is going to accelerate is previously you had to go find these tools. You had to go looking for all these AI tools to do specific things. Now what's happening is the major tech platforms that you use are infusing them right into it. So chat, uh, chat spot is being built by Dharmesh Shah, the co-founder and CTO of HubSpot. It infuses open AI capabilities for image and language generation right into HubSpot, writing emails, blog posts, social shares, everything. Salesforce is introducing Einstein GPT. It's in testing right now. So the entire Salesforce platform will have generative AI capabilities baked right into Salesforce connected to your CRM database. So now it's like writing emails, but knowing the history within the CRM of that customer or that client. Google has announced infusion into Google Workspace. So if your company uses Google Workspace, you're going to have it in docs, slides, sheets, meetings, everything. It'll, it'll be baked right in. You'll be able to write entire documents and proposals right within the thing. And Microsoft is doing the same thing with 365. They're going to have what are called co-pilots. The co-pilots will build your presentations for you, write your Word docs, analyze your spreadsheets, find anomalies in your data, build your pivot tables, your visualizations, analyze the data. All of it is going to get turned on for all knowledge work. So that, again, this isn't like go find a thing and it helps marketers. This is everybody in the organization all of a sudden has generative AI capabilities. So what that means is we're going to have next generation professionals. We're going to have marketers and accountants and attorneys and engineers and like people who have to evolve to use this smarter technology. They're, they're not going to have a choice if they want to stay relevant. And so that's the key thing is like these big tech companies are in essence forcing this change on knowledge work because the tools are going to be omnipresent within all of the software we're already using every day. Now this has positive impacts. Like as marketers, we can finally deliver true personalization and you know amazing consumer experiences. We can unlock new creative potential. We can drive performance. So there are there are issues with this. There are certainly you know impact and things people aren't prepared for that we can talk about in the Q and A. But there are a lot of positives to it as well. So just to kind of help set the baseline. Um, the definition I settle on years ago for AI, my favorite comes from Demis Asabas, who is the co-founder and CEO of Google DeepMind. He created an independent London-based research lab called DeepMind. It was acquired by Google in 2014. Google then had two AI research labs under the umbrella company. There was Google Brain and Google and DeepMind. They merged them about three weeks ago to a single lab called Google, Google DeepMind, which Demis is in charge of. So Demis is a very important person, not only in business, but in um, human history. He's working on solving human biology, nuclear fusion energy, um, climate change. Like He's trying to solve intelligence, basically. And so he does it with Google's money. <laughs> So he says AI is the science of making machines smart. The best way to understand this is place, replace machines with software. So again, think about the software you use getting smarter and able to adapt and make better recommendations and predictions. So at a high level, we have AI as an umbrella term for tools and technology that make software smart. The primary subset is machine learning. This is literally the software learning. Inputs come in, I send an email to 10,000 people, there's opens, there's clicks, there's conversions. It learns from those things, and then it improves the next email that goes out based on it. So the human doesn't have to analyze the data, doesn't have to make the adaptations. The machine learning allows the software itself to actually learn from data. Inputs go in, output is our predictions and generations. Deep learning is the attempt to give the machine human-like capabilities, to teach it to function like the human brain. So that's the breakthroughs we've seen in language and in vision that I'm going to talk about in a moment. So what we have had in marketing for the last decade is largely the area of prediction. We have had AI that enabled better forecasting models, pattern recognition and data, personalization of emails and content, and recommendation engines. So recommending products on Amazon, recommending shows on Netflix, um, or recommending content on a media site, recommending content in your news feeds. That's what AI has largely been up until last year. Then we had the breakthrough in computer vision. So computer vision had a massive kind of watershed moment back in 2011 when this guy, Jeff Hinton, who recently was in the news for leaving Google and saying AI is going to destroy humanity. He and his team of two PhD students, one of which is now the head of science at OpenAI, um, proved 
that computers could recognize objects and images basically in 2011, that you could use AI to do this. And that triggered this moment where all the major companies like Facebook and Google and Microsoft and Amazon started building massive AI research labs to figure out how to commercialize this technology. Fast forward to last spring, Dolly 2 is introduced by OpenAI that does image generation. What we're seeing on the screen here was image gen, same technology from Google that was never released. They've never publicly made it available. So the ability for the machine to now do these things, this again is what an exponential growth curve looks like. This is mid journey. So this is another image generation technology. On the left is the February, 2022 output from a prompt about a boy. And it's abstract. The same prompt over a 12 month period has gone to photorealistic indistinguishable from reality. This all occurred over five generations in a, a 14 month period. The same thing is happening in language generation, video generation. So these technologies are getting so powerful so fast that it's hard for the human mind to even comprehend what does it look like in 12 months, 18 months, three years. And then the same thing again is occurring in language. So we've had Google Smart Compose for years in Gmail, it was finishing sentences for you. Facebook recommended replies to posts. Your, your iPhone recommends replies to text messages. So language generation isn't new. The prediction of words isn't new, but the ability for these things to do it creatively and to have reasoning capability and chain of thought, like this is the stuff that to me living in it is still mind blowing sometimes. So this is an example of a prompt I gave saying, write a clever out of office email. I've been writing out of office emails for 23 years. I'm done. I, I have nothing creative left to say that I'm going to be out of the office. Well, then I give it to GPT-4 and it says, I hope this digital missive finds you thriving in the realms of human endeavor. My response times are going to be as slow as a tortoise browsing the internet on a 56K modem. Like I, I'm a writer for a living and I, I couldn't have done this. Like I, you couldn't give me a day and I wouldn't have written a paragraph like this. It's not in my DNA. And so that's the time where you start realizing like, wow, these things are capable of doing stuff that I, I don't really even comprehend. And I know how language models work. So this is a good moment to say though, that there are massive limitations. And, and I think this is the problem that's happening is you're having a lot of CEOs and boards and venture capital firms like, hey, let's just get rid of all the marketers. Let's get rid of our content team, our writing team. We don't need all these people if GPT-4 can do this. Like, well, no, hold on a second. One, we don't own anything that AI creates. The US Copyright Office has said on March 16th this year <clears throat> that humans have to author something. That hasn't changed from since, since 1870. That's been the rule. They did say though that a prompt is not human authorship. So if you use a prompt to write a paper, you don't own the copyright to that paper. If you're paying an outside agency to do it for you, you don't own under the work for hire agreement, whatever they're creating for you. Same holds true for images, videos, code, audio, anything you generate, you don't own it. Talk to your IP attorneys. I, I always give the pause at this moment. I am not an IP attorney. I spend a lot of money with IP attorneys, but talk to your IP attorneys. The second issue is they have massive flaws. They make stuff up all the time. It's called hallucinations, technically. They don't actually know facts. They're just predicting words in a sequence. They don't know people, places, things, numbers, math. They don't know any of it. So if you use this and it does something, like an attorney got busted last week because he turned in a paper to a judge, uh, an argument, that cited things that didn't exist because he used ChatGPT to write the argument. And then ChatGPT told him, yes, those citations are real. And then they checked and they're like, no, they're not. And so you have issues where people are using these tools under the assumption that they actually know all this stuff and they don't. But they have amazing use cases beyond just writing. Transcription of content, summarization of content, ideation, strategy. All of these are ways you can use writing tools that are incredible that have nothing to do with it writing for you. It's not a replacement. And then the real power is gonna be in bigger organizations taking a language model, the base architecture that powers these writing tools and customizing it on your own proprietary data. That's what Bloomberg did. They took 40 years of financial data and trained a language model on it and it became an internal knowledge assistant. So now rather than searching the server for something, you just interact with a chat bot that knows everything that's ever happened in the organization and you now have that knowledge at your fingertips. And then I gotta, the way- I gotta share yeah, one go ahead, thing. David. So I was at AICPA Engage yesterday uh, and the day before, and there's a company called Core V. And yeah. Lucia uh, was a former head of specialty tax for MGO. 
Uh, she grew her practice from zero to 10 million in three and a half years, left MGO three months ago, went to over to Core V, and they now launched a product called Insight. And they're basically taking all of the specialty tax code, 1,500 different strategies that exist today that she has done over the last decade of an expert and mapping every one of them out in an AI platform. So your people going forward that do specialty tax can literally save 20 to 100 hours on research by using this platform going forward that they launched yesterday for the first time. So, the, so they'll have 1,500 different workflows that you can go into a chat bot, and now all of this language is being undone. Same thing PwC is doing for their tax strategy department. They dedicated a billion dollars of an investment. So the only reason I brought that up is it's so timely because oh, yeah. um, literally yesterday I was hearing about this technology coming out, and, and somebody like her who has such robust experience, literally every week they're sitting down, going through her process, mapping it out in AI, improving it. And pretty soon they'll have 500 prompts in the next three months. Yep. That's exactly how it plays out because when you use chat GPT, you're using a general language model. It's just trained on the internet. It's trained on what it has access to. It doesn't have access to your proprietary data and strategies and all that stuff. So the future is training these things, these foundation models on your proprietary stuff, because it's, that's the, that's the moat. That's the thing nobody else has is the data you have. And so on the left, you have language model companies. These are the companies that are building these foundational models. And then on the right, you have sample application layer companies like Jasper is a very popular one and writer. Mm -hmm. These are companies building software on top of the language models. So rather than going direct to OpenAI and using ChatGPT, you could go get a license to Jasper and get your whole team licenses. And then everybody has access to these tools. So this is kind of like how the landscape plays out. All right, so I'll kind of wrap here with some, some things I would recommend. One is you have to focus on education and training. The, the, this is the critical step for everyone in your organization. You can't understand and build an AI strategy and think about the future of the company and you know, zooming into your marketing department without a deeper comprehension of what this technology is and how it works, and then a competency that you form by actually experimenting with the technology yourself. You have to go in and try these writing tools and see what they're capable of. You have to try, there's, um, there's a, a plugin for ChatGPT called Code Interpreter, which is like a PhD le level data analyst. Like it, it's insane what it's capable of doing and it's free. And so you have to see these things to kind of believe them. We have two offerings, like, so we have tons of free offerings to the Marketing Institute. We have weekly podcasts, we have newsletter, we have webinars, we have blueprints, we have all these assets. But for people who want to like really dive in and go deeper on this, we have an on-demand series, a 17 course on-demand series. It's about eight hours of content. So it's one, one day of your life, but it has a final exam, professional certificate. So this is something that was custom built to be a step-by-step -step learning journey. And then we also have our marketing AI conference that David alluded to in Cleveland, uh, July 26th to the 28th at the convention center, right across from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So those are kind of more, if you're ready to dive in and have someone on your team really focus on this, there's a couple of, of options. The second thing I would encourage you to do is build an internal AI council. Now this could be two people to start, or it could be 15 people, but get it cross discipline. I see oftentimes marketing and communications needs to be the lead here because you have to unify the different business functions. Messaging becomes critical. Positioning becomes critical. The, the mission statement of the council, this is like marketing 101 stuff. And so I think marketing and communications is often going to lead this. I'm seeing that happen in some bigger enterprises that we're talking to. And then the last thing also often marketing communications led need responsible AI principles and generative AI policies for the organization. Um, I'll share two quick resources. One is a creative commons template that I published in January. This is what I call the responsible AI manifesto. It was meant to be a template for people who had nothing to start from a, a from a point of having this framework. So basically take it, edit it, do whatever you want with it. It is available on our site. I'll share the link with David, but it's also in the deck here. And then the other one is you have to guide your team on what they're allowed to do. There's so many uh, employees and organizations, especially in highly regulated industries, industries with a lot of confidential private data, who are probably using chat GPT unbeknownst to leadership to do their jobs. And they're not sure if they're allowed to be, and maybe they're just not even talking about it because they don't want to tell anybody. I really think it's critical that every organization state clearly, listen, we encourage the use of these tools. Here's how to use them safely. Here's how, do not put this kind of data into these tools because 
these foundational companies keep that data and it you know, trains the next models. So you need to really establish, here's how we use language, image, um, video generation. Here's how we use these tools safely within the organization to encourage performance and creativity improvements. And then just kind of with like this whole idea of like, this stuff's not going away. Like the, the marketing world is going to get smarter. The business world is going to get smarter. We are early in it. So there's a chance to be a leader in this space and really, you know, evolve your, your own career, your team, and kind of embrace what's possible with this stuff. And so with that, I will stop talking and turn it over to David to do some Q&A. Awesome, Paul. A lot, lot of content there. And I'm more nervous now than I was about 22 minutes ago. <laughs> um, I, I, I agree with you. I don't want full automation, but I'm sure it's going to happen at some point in certain places, you know, spaces or places. Yesterday, I read an article that McKinsey and company, 50% of their staff, all of their staff is using generative AI now. Uh, 50% of everybody at McKinsey and Company Consulting. On the other hand, BDO, the seventh largest CPA firm in the world, is blocked ChatGPT from their entire organization. So it's a really interesting time from that perspective. If there is one thing that, that you would see, you know, the number one question that you're getting asked today from marketers and growth leaders, you know, across the board, and I'm, I, I, maybe it's content related, maybe it's not, but uh, what is it? I mean, I do get asked on the fear side, like, is it going to take our jobs? That's a very common one. Um, I would say the most common is how to get started. Like just a lot, it's overwhelming. I mean, it's an abstract topic if you haven't really studied the space at all. And it just seems daunting. What's happening now though, is there's a lot of pressure being put on by CEOs and boards and private equity and venture capital, like that are basically going to the CMOs and saying, what is our strategy here? Like, what are we doing about AI? So I'm getting a lot of calls from CMOs saying, I don't know how to answer the question. Like, <laughs> I think some people on my team are using Jasper, but other than that, like, I don't, we don't really have a plan. So getting started is the first one. And, and so I always tell people like, well, there's, there's a couple ways. Like one is the, the simplest I'll, I'll just focus on is a use case model. Take, look at your team, look at where the time's going, look at where your budgets are going. It's heavily content-based. You're doing podcasts, webinars, eBooks, blog posts, whatever there's a chance that that's where a lot of your human resources are going. A lot of time is going into the creation and promotion of that content. I would maybe start there, like focus on where could we use AI to assist here? So like we have a podcast we do every week. It used to take about 20 to 25 hours probably to do each episode. We looked at the 21 steps in that process and we infused AI into about half of them. And we can now do each episode for probably between five and eight hours. Wow. Nobody got fired. Nobody got like laid off. Like, our chief growth officer, who was trying to do a lot of this stuff manually, freed her up to spend more time actually interacting with our community. Like just the way I look at this is all of us have this extensive wish list of campaigns, ideas, like things we're not doing because we're stretching our people thin. So have that wish list. And every time you save 20 hours over here from AI, put it over here to the wish list. Like it doesn't have to result in people's jobs going away, it just results in a more productive and higher performing group. Well, just so everybody knows, I am going to share the AI policy link. I think that's the number one question I'm getting right now. Um, is, is there some sort of policy or outline we can start sharing within the firm? I do know some firms that have started using them, uh, but I was talking to LBMC. They've implemented a bunch of different policies um, on their end, but I'll make sure to share that with everybody here. Um, in the meantime, I have one other question. If anybody else has questions, enter them in the chat, unmute yourself, please. It's meant to be a conversation, um, you know, around everything that we're doing. The other example was with a private equity firm that's acquired three CPA firms the last couple of days, and they proposed me a question. And uh, I think this really, you know, gets us thinking outsourcing is top of mind for almost every firm when it comes to strategic growth going forward. Um, if you had a blank check, would you write a check to go and invest into AI or would you go buy an outsourced firm in India or South Africa or the Philippines, uh, depending on the type of work you're using for them? And the reality is PE is starting to invest more into the AI side of it um, and not as much necessarily on, on the outsourcing side of it, knowing there's a place you know, for that function and role. But if you're using outsourcing strictly for process and data entry, that won't be needed in a certain, you know, in the next two to three years. Um, true, true trusted advisors will be needed, but but not necessarily the same way we're thinking about outsourcing today. And so I know that's top of mind for everybody. Any questions or thoughts amongst the group? 
Pauletta, you just kind of threw a question in here. You mentioned that AI has helped with the steps of publishing a podcast. Can you detail out what AI did to change this process? Yeah, Paul. there's um, so a couple of things. So we <clears throat> we use it to curate topics for one. So the way our podcast structure works is I have a co-host, my co-author, my chief content officer, Mike, and I do the podcast together. So throughout the week, we curate topics. And some of that is manual, like just my Twitter feed I follow and different things like that. And I'll drop topics in. Others is you can go into GPT-4 and say, connect it to the browser plugin and say, what are the top 10 things that happened in AI this week? And it'll write you a brief on the top 10 things. And so I'll often actually reference that versus the topics I have and see if maybe it caught something I didn't notice throughout the week. So we use it to build out the topic list. And then we have a rapid fire, which is all the other stuff. So sometimes the things that make it into the rep are things that I identified using GPT-4 as like, what was the big news in AI this week? Um, so curation of topics is one. We do not use it to write the scripts, but I have tested that and it is insanely good at writing human sounding podcast scripts. You can give it a prompt and then keep pushing it and it'll actually write a script for a podcast if you needed it to do that. We, again, we don't use it for that, but it is possible. We use AI to transcribe the audio. We use AI to clean up the transcription of the audio. We use AI to turn each uh, segment of the podcast into a blog post. So we do summarization of the transcript. So you just drop the transcript into GPT-4 and say, write me a summary of this. We turn that into a podcast. We use AI to turn the blog posts into social media shares. Um, so it is, it's like literally in, in, in the majority of the production, planning and promotion phases of what we do. And we use a collection of different tools to do it. When you were discussing ownership of copy that's generated by AI. So you did the podcast, so it's transcribing your words. And then you say, okay, write a podcast, a, a blog post from my transcript. Now who owns that copy? that copyright our interpretation is we do it's still our original words there it's just a summary of what we've said so there's nothing where we're actually having the ai write anything original original thought it's all just taking what we've said and, and summarizing it um i i think that there's a lot of gray area in copyright law and the copyright office acknowledges that they're doing listening sessions right now and trying to figure out how to evolve their own guidance but in that case, I would be 99.9% .9 confident that we could win a copyright case against that use case. Um, so that's how, yeah, I, I don't worry too much about that one. And then are you just using ChatGPT to, to transpose your audio or are you using another? So it sounds like you're using different AI technologies. We, we do, yeah, there's, um, so, you can use, if you do Zoom, so we record our podcasts in Zoom. There is a built-in transcription. They use otter.ai to do it. Um, but what we do is give you the link. So we use Descript. It's like, I don't know, 15 bucks a month per user. So it's like really affordable technology. That's what we use to do uh, the transcription, which has speaker identification. You can remove filler words. There's all kinds of like interesting AI tools baked into their platform. We use that for all webinar recordings and all podcast audio recordings. Then we also use Descript to cut up uh, segments of the podcast very quickly, generate images for them, generate captions. A lot of that happens in there. And then the the transcription will take out of there. And then I think the team mainly uses G chat GPT, but we also experiment. We, cons we have like five or six AI writing tools that we experiment with all the time because they all leapfrog each other all the time. Like the tech, again, it's moving so quick. You can't just assume Jasper is going to keep figuring it all out. So we'll try Jasper, Cohere, Writer, HyperWrite, um, Anthropic is an interesting one. So we constantly test them, but I think ChatGPT is the default for the team when it comes to doing the summarization. I know there's something that's come across my radar recently, and I don't know a ton of about it. And, and great question, Pauletta. Um, AI checkers. So I know there's plagiarism checkers on content. Is AI checkers a thing and where is it at from? They're, from a, they're a thing and they don't work and they never will. Okay. Yeah. I. It's like, this is a problem if you have kids. Um, they're being used in schools. Like Turnitin is a really popular software. It has like 11,000 school districts use Turnitin. And they turned on an AI detecting tool where, where you have teachers failing students for claiming that they used AI to write something. That tool is lucky if it's 50% accurate. Like, and there's no clear path to solving that because it's not plagiarized content. It's not copied and scraped from anywhere. 
like its original content based on predictions of words in a sequence. So Google has said, like Google was at Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Google was asked on 60 Minutes about that exact thing. And he said, we think we'll make progress toward it. Like the way they're trying to do it is to basically watermark outputted text from the original language models themselves. But it's just going to be a race of AI against AI. Like if you build it that way, it's like, fine, I'll use an AI that like adjust the outputted text so that it's not distinguishable anymore from, you know, that, and it's just not going to work. So it's like a fool's errand in my opinion right now. And, but schools are literally relying on it because they have teachers and administrators who don't understand how this stuff works and just assume that it's right. You made me feel good that I asked the same question somebody on 60 minutes did. So <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a very common question. And I talk to a lot of school districts, deans of schools, like I get those calls all the time from these schools that have no idea what to do about this stuff. Stacy uh, asked in the chat if you have any recommendations for resources uh, for marketing departments to leverage what AI tools they should be exploring or taking a look at uh, as part of their tech stack or, or you know, strategy. Yeah, there, so we tried for a while to to be like a clearinghouse for the best AI tools. And that was one of my original efforts. We actually built a buyer's guide back in 2018. We had an AI score tool that would map use cases to vendors. Um, that was when there was a few hundred of these things. Like there's, there's gonna be 10,000 of these tools by the end of the year. The reality is the best way to do this is start with your existing tech stack. If you use HubSpot, if you use Microsoft, Google, Adobe, like just, start with the trusted known companies that aren't going to be obsoleted next week. Like there are, there are generative AI companies that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars that could be out of business in two months because they have to now compete against Google and Microsoft for generative AI and Grammarly, which has 30 million customers. Like it's such a dynamic space. It's really hard to make bets. So start with the known trusted companies and then focus on those use cases of where, what use case would you get the most value out of? And then you literally can go search AI for ad budget management. And then you have to go through a vendor assessment. I'll give you a link. So we have in our book, we address how to do this, but we actually have a free download for a vendor assessment. I would advise using this when you're talking to these AI vendors. So that book link I just put in, if you scroll about halfway down the page, it is right below the table of contents. There's a piloting AI workbook, which lets you go through and build use cases and prioritize and rate them based on their value to you. And then to the right of that is the vendor uh, tech vendor assessment. That's just a Word document that kind of guides you the questions to ask and how to evaluate these vendors. They're, they're both really good resources to help get started. That's awesome. Thank you very much for sharing. Other thoughts, questions? Paul, Paul, this isn't marketing related, but I'm kind of curious to get your insight on these extinction level events um, that people are talking about. What's your opinion on that? So I will, I'll share with you our podcast link real quick. Um, and I'll try and point to a couple specific episodes, but this has been a, obviously a very popular topic the last few weeks. There's been a lot going on. Congress has taken an interest in AI. There's been hearings about generative AI. Uh, there has been the Future of Life Institute letter, which came out probably two months ago about some AI researchers fear about this. There was two weeks ago, the AI is an existential risk to humanity statement from some of the top AI researchers. We had Jeff Hinton leave Google and claim it was going to destroy humanity. My, my basic take on this is I am, I understand the thought process they go through to arrive at these concerns. Like it is, I, I wouldn't debate that this is a, a possibility. They don't have a very clear way of saying how exactly it's a threat to humanity. So the statement last week or two weeks ago was that it's basically on par with pandemics and nuclear weapons. Pandemics and nuclear weapons, there is a very clear path. Oh yes, a pandemic spreads, people die. Nuclear weapons explode, people die. AI, how do people die? Like it, it, it's not specifically clear. There's like these thought experiments you can go through to arrive at this end state where sure, okay, ex mahina could be real and this happens. Like, not sure yet. Okay. but that's not the current state. 
And so I'm happy that there are AI researchers and scientists thinking about the long-term potential impacts of AI that could be catastrophic because they are possible. The reality is we are living in a phase right now where the tech doesn't have to get any better to deal with massive scale of disinformation, misinformation, synthetic content that'll throw the next election into chaos. Like it will happen. Like we are not going to be able to distinguish whether images and videos and content is real or not. That's, that's on our front doorstep. We have bias inherent in decision-making algorithms in financial services and home lending in education systems. Um, we have impact on knowledge workers in the next one to two years. Like these are the things I want top AI researchers thinking about because they are going to impact all of us imminently. And there's no debating that. Like it, it's inevitable that these things will occur in the next two years. That's where most of my concern and my thought process lies. Disruption of the education system. These are real. And so I, I while I get what they're saying and why they're saying it, um, I would much rather that there was large efforts being made to solve the very real issues that we are going to face. Thanks, Paul. Mm -hmm. One, you mentioned a comment. Um, earlier that you're seeing in B2B other marketing departments and growth leaders being responsible uh, for part of this evolution within firms for, for being a resource or a guidance. How, how are marketing departments, you know, starting to, what are you seeing evolve, right? You know, when we talk to Digital Deep Dive, some of the roles we see coming into, you know, the marketplace might be a chief technical marketing officer, prompt engineers, right? Um, what are you seeing other other B2B marketing departments and teams starting to, to own and figuring out how to, to be that steward within the organization. I know many people on this call are, are going to be playing that role for sure, without question in mind. Some of them are one team, uh, one person team. Some of them have 22 people on their team. For most cases, it's, it's still in the education phase and trying to figure out what this means. Again, keep in mind, like ChatGPT came out seven months ago. For, for most organizations, they started thinking about AI seven months ago. And then we had winter break and then you come back and it started the year, like realistically based on our data, like our website data, our podcast data, our traffic data, our sales data, February is basically when most organizations started really trying to figure out what in the world was going on. And so I think that we're only a few months into this a lot of it is honestly stuff like this. Like just today, I talk with a Fortune 50 financial services company. I have a call with a top five hospital system today. It's all intros to their team of what is AI. Sometimes there's 300 marketers on the call. Sometimes it's 50, but it's basically trying to say, this is what's going on. And then there's, that's the first step for them in trying to let their workers know, one, we're paying attention. We're developing a point of view. We're bringing this person in to explain this stuff to you. We're going to be open and transparent about this because we accept that, it, you know, the thing people aren't asking is, is my job safe? Like, but that's what they're all thinking. That's what writers are thinking. It's what designers are thinking. Like, and so I think forward looking leaders are opening up the conversation. They don't have the answers yet. They don't have the roadmap, but they're trying to like figure this out. And so I would say that's where most people are, is the early days of forming an AI council and starting to get education. The ones that are accelerating are getting pressure from their investors or their board to do something now. And then the CEO shows up and says, what's the plan? And then the CMO says, we're using Jasper. And then they call me like, they're like what else should we tell them is basically where we're at. I know for a fact that private equity, that's where they're spending a lot of their energy right now how to make firms grow faster, generate more revenue, become more efficient across the board. There's significant dollars going into that. There's uh, 12 million employees in the United States that work for private equity backed companies. The number one thing private equity does is cut costs. Yeah. I mean, they, they do a lot, but like this is a lever they can pull that they're now realizing exists. This yep. is part of my concern about knowledge work. Being I know a few, uh, a few firms starting to create AI committees firm wide. So not just thinking from a growth and marketing perspective, yeah. it's as much from a practitioner and operations and process perspective. Yeah. No, it's got to be a cross function thing. Sometimes it starts in marketing. Like some, there's one big company we're working with where it's let's build a blueprint for marketing over the next three months. And then let's take that in the fall 
system wide, but let's prove in this isolated way we can do it because we can move faster. Then we can take it out to ops and HR and finance and legal who are going to be more resistant to it. You got two great comments on uh, some uh, evangelists of yours, both on oh, the nice. courses <laughs> and the book. So uh, always good refer uh, references across the board. Any other questions or thoughts uh, anybody has as it relates to AI tools that you guys are using? Um, we've got Paul here for another, you know, about 13 minutes. So, uh, you know, take advantage if we can of his uh, expertise, visibility and time. Um, I would say, I don't know if there's any other Dynamics users in the group, um, but we've started exploring, uh, it's called Viva Sales Insights. It's Paul, you mentioned um, Salesforce is having their own AI piece. I think this is Dynamics own piece to it. Um, and it's interesting to see how all these are going to come together because we also use IntroHive, which I'm sure some of you in the room are familiar with. Um, so, you know, do you really need all these tools anymore or is something natively within your CRM system now going to accomplish all of those things where it shows relationships and it shows all those insights into uh, how you've talked with your prospects and, and clients? Um, so that's just, we're just getting into looking into that, but that's kind of been wild to me to see the evolution of that and then also with the assistance of the co-pilot that's coming out it's very interesting and just kind of a lot to figure out <laughs> i'm excited it is co-pilot yeah I, the co-pilots yeah, right. are going to be everywhere it's not going to be a single thing like it's going to be a, literally in everything microsoft does yeah it's going to be really cool i did for the first time i used an ai powerpoint generator i did a retreat a couple of weeks ago and gave it a ton of information and it was incredible um the end result was incredibly robust great examples like it, it it i can't wait for copilot i'm very excited yeah and the thing like i was saying about the exponential growth curve you have to realize like this is the dumbest ai you will ever use it's not going to go backwards so like whatever you're seeing today it's only going to get smarter like we're in the top of the first inning to use a baseball analogy for this technology there are some things that could slow it down, like regulation and, or, you know, like public outcry about this stuff, but the technology itself shows no signs of slowing. And there are some inevitable things that come next that we didn't touch on today um, that will really race this forward. Like action transformers is the big one right now. So right now these things just generate stuff. They don't take action on your behalf but all the research labs have been working for years on action. So books your flight, files your taxes, like what it does it for you. It fills out forms It you know, takes actions on your behalf. That's, that's what they're all trying to do. And there's early signs of it with like chat GPT plugins and things called auto GPTs, but I could see the accounting profession within the next like two years, this true intelligent automation of a lot of tasks is going to be a very impactful thing. It was it was mind blowing how many workflow operation companies were at engaged this year. I've never even heard of before, uh, specific to AI and workflows and 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 just the operational efficiencies that it can create at scale. Just just looking at this from a different lens. I mean, is there anything in the AI world that you would maybe not prioritize or stay away from initially right now that that might be more of a red flag? And again, like you said, we're at the top of the first inning. That yeah, there. I I just I mean I think the risks right now are unstructured use of this within corporations, where we're just letting employees figure it out for themselves and run whatever trials they want, and you may not even know they're using this technology. So I I think the the biggest red flag for me right now is inaction from leaders that you really needs guidance. There's people afraid. They're uncertain. Um, and I, I think we just we just need to take a leadership role and help them realize like, okay, we don't know all this stuff yet, but we're developing a point of view. And the the link I put in um, that I give it context to that city of Boston link I put in from Wired Magazine, it was like, it's the best public facing case I've seen yet of any organization taking an ownership stake in this. And so what happened was like the, I think it's the CIO of the city of Boston sent out an email that said, listen, we, we don't know all, how this is all gonna work, but we're embracing this. We encourage you government agency workers to, to experiment with this technology in a responsible way. 
here are our responsible AI guidelines for how to use generative AI. And they, both of those are publicly available. You can actually download a PDF of the email and the guidelines from the city of Boston. It's a great example of how you could quickly probably put something together for your team uh, or to take to you know the CEO, the C-suite and say, listen, this is what I'm thinking is let's in the next 30 days, get these basic generative AI policies in place to give some guidance to our team. And then let's, you know, schedule an intro to AI session with the team in August. Like I would just leave this and, and pick like one to three things to do. Um, and I think the more you think about the totality of what your, your team may be thinking about and doing already, and just trying to be proactive in addressing that, there's no wrong way to do it other than shutting it off. In my opinion, like it's like school systems. I get asked this by the deans and like, you know, principals and it's like, should we just not allow it? like, no, that's a terrible idea. Like it's not going anywhere. If you shut it off, now you're going to have employees like, why am I working for a company that doesn't even accept that AI is like changing our industry? They're trying to pretend like it doesn't exist. So I, I just, I don't think that's the answer, but I think action in some way um, with point of view and some basic policies is a good starting point. I have one last question. If anybody else has any questions or thoughts, go for it. AI and SEO, how big of a player will that end up or is become, I mean, we talked about content. There's no question that's part of it, but analyzing data, I mean, having a more inclusive one stop, I mean, really turnkey type of approach. I mean, is AI going to really influence? And if it does, that's going to change how Google probably displays itself and everything it's going to do from that perspective anyway. But just curious more from AI for SEO, what are you seeing, hearing, thinking at this point? It, it's a, <clears throat> it's going to transform it. So Google's already testing these generative AI results in their search page. So if you haven't, yeah, if you haven't tried Google Bard yet, you can go do it for free right now, just bard.google.com. It's their chat GPT, basically. It's a watered down version of what they have, but it, whatever. So the search result, the top thing will become a generated AI narrative powered by one of Google's language models. They're trying to figure out how and where the ads and the organic results weave into that. But the reality is Microsoft and Google have no idea how this plays out. Like I've talked to people, you know, people on the inside and like, they just don't know. The assumption I am under, and I have been for months is that there will be a drop in organic traffic. I don't know if it's gonna be 10% or 90%. And I don't know if it's gonna happen in two months or 12 months. But what I've been guiding marketing teams is assume there will be a drop in organic traffic to your site and don't rely on it to, to be at the benchmarks it's previously been. So when you're setting KPIs for next year, like it's just not gonna be the same. Um, I think you just have to commit to regularly monitoring this, looking for any insights that are coming out from trusted resources like SEO Moz or um, you know, search engine land, things like that, of what they're saying and then what guidance you're hearing from Microsoft and Google themselves. But it's going to change the future of everything, like how we consume information, how we find answers. It, it's going to evolve. We just don't know exactly what it'll look like. The thing I tell people is that I'm fairly confident in this prediction, more human content wins. So what I mean by that is stuff that can't be easily faked. So if you read a how-to or a listicle on my blog, in the back of your mind now is always going to be, today I write this. And it's not that it's not valuable, but you're just like, eh, like it's just another AI written article. So when this technology is commoditized, which it already is, and we can all create as much content as, as we want, and it sounds and looks human-like, the reality is I'm going to rather just go listen to a podcast where I listen to someone talk, or you're going to want to sit in a session like this, where it's like, okay, this is not scripted. Like this guy's actually talking to me. This is a human giving me a point of view on something. So I think videos, events, podcasts, editorials, interviews with strong points of view, I would think about those things from a brand perspective for your organizations. And I would start leaning more heavily into more human content, the things that people, because the way I look at this is, Chess achieved superhuman level capabilities, AI did in chess years ago. Have you ever watched AI play AI in chess? No, it doesn't exist. Nobody cares, they're, they're machines, but people watch grandmasters play each other. Chess is more popular than ever, and yet AI perfected it. So I think that's what happens with content. It's like, yes, okay, AI can write great, but I don't want the AI written stuff. I, I want the human thing. I wanna know there's a human behind it. 
And so I do think that there's going to be this point where we really just crave and seek and value stuff we know came from a human in art, in writing, in videography and everything. So we talk a lot about intellectual property, right? Like the importance of creating everything we create today is intellectual property and it's going to become even more important around that going forward. So, so the summary is yes, it's going to change. Yes. Search console came out with generative content recommendations going forward and they're starting to build it into search console more and more. Um, but we have to, to keep it as a strategic initiative as a priority, but be aware of all the changes that are happening basically monthly at this point. Daily. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. yeah pretty quick. Anything else, guys? This has been awesome, Paul. I really appreciate your time. Um, I'll make sure everybody gets uh, all the links you've provided us, um, all of the information for the conference coming up and the resources. Um, I know, like I said, a lot of people are engaged uh, this week on a lot of emails, so we'll share the recording, um, but really, really appreciate your time. I'll be there at the end of July, so I look forward to uh, everything I'm going to receive from that perspective. Um, to the rest of the group, thank you guys for joining us today. One quick note, I didn't get a chance at the top of the call, um, but I wanted to introduce Brandon Ferris. Brandon joined our team June 1st, um, taking over our digital marketing and events manager. He has uh, 10 plus years of experience uh, between Skoda, Markham, uh, HubSpot, and everything digital. So we're, we're excited to have Brandon here. He was a former colleague of Allison's. Um, so it's great to uh, it's great to have him on the team. You'll see him going forward. Um, we'll be in touch with more follow up coming soon. Paul, any final notes? No, appreciate the time. Love the questions, and uh, yeah, we have the free Slack community as well. So if you're interested in this, or have people interested in it, just take advantage of the free stuff. There's great ways to keep everybody informed and get the get your organization moving forward. Awesome. Thanks again, guys. Have a great day. Thank you.